right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pray for us. Father, I pray you help us today. Um, I pray you give us perspective on your word uh, that we can begin to see the beauty of your word, the perfection of your word, the promises of your word. I pray that you Help us not be wise in our own eyes, but I pray that you would give us eyes that would be wise, but wise with your wisdom. Um, pray you help us today as we look at the Gospel of Matthew, and we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So I love this picture, uh, the biblical theology of this picture and it's just uh, one more argument in favor of the idea that the Bible cannot be anti-woman because after all it's not the seed of Adam who crushes the serpent's head it's the seed of the woman um, what we're going to look at today and the next two class periods we're going to look at things in the Gospel of Matthew and I realized that probably you're under a lot of weight from your other classes, so I wanted to give you a little time off in terms of uh, this class and the things that are being required. And so um, as we look at Matthew, uh, don't feel like you have to do any homework uh, just enjoy. Uh, if you want to read through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, you could do that if you wanted, but there's nothing due uh, today or Monday and Wednesday. Uh, make sure that you take the attendance quiz in bright space. And so what we're going to look at today, just some things that I find interesting in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, um, there's probably something in Matthew that you've never heard about, and it's related in the scholarly literature um, to the word toledoth. We're going to look at what in the world that is about and how it relates to Matthew and how it points to the meta narrative, plot, symmetrical, elegant uh, unity in the Bible. Uh, we'll look at this idea of the virgin will conceive and bear a son. And I hope we have time to take up that question, is, is it really the virgin will conceive or does the original text say a young woman will conceive? We'll look at the evidence uh, there. We'll look at some of the problems in the genealogies uh, when you compare the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. And uh, some people would say even within Matthew's genealogy itself, um, we'll look at the five sections in Matthew and what that may be about. And then uh, we'll look at the idea of Jesus as a super Moses. Now, having just laid this out, I want to say up front um, that uh, I really enjoy the fact that I've gotten to spend a lifetime uh, studying God's word and uh, a lifetime in the original languages in God's uh, word. Um, in terms of God's gift to me, that's a precious gift that I uh, love. Um, I don't know what my life would be uh, without that. Uh, if, if ever I fell into mental decline and could not interact with God's word in the original language, I, I would feel very sad about that. But having said that, I want to say this to you. There probably isn't a question that's ever tripped you up that doesn't have a beautiful answer from the Bible. Um, when, when I became a Christian as an 18-year-old, um, I knew the Bible was true, but I was afraid it might not stand up to... Um, academic intellectual rigor. Uh, I was afraid that questions like this might somehow disprove the Bible. Well, I'm 57 years old uh, now. Uh, 
I've almost spent a generation in the original text. And I can tell you this, I'm more convinced of the Bible's truth today than I ever was uh, uh, as a young person. Um, I have to admit there are some questions that are still unresolved uh, for me, but the vast majority of questions not only have an answer, but they have a beautiful answer. Um, so when we come to these things and uh, maybe uh, some of these things like particularly uh, this uh, question, and you think, oh my goodness, can the Bible stand up to rigorous uh, research? The Bible can stand up to rigorous research. And it's not some kind of progressive new answer. It's the answer that the church has given uh, all along. So part of what we're going to do today as we have time is, is look at some of the beauty and even beauty from some of the difficult uh, questions. So let's uh, dive in. One of the things you may or may not know uh, is that Matthew divides his gospel into five sections. Now, uh, I put the sections here, and you may look at that and say, well, I don't really think that's all that significant. Well, let me put it up in the original language. And you don't even have to be able to read the original language to realize that these are verbatim exactly the same uh, sentences. And so when Matthew is presenting his gospel, um, he's saying these are the five parts. Um, this is Jesus teaching. This is uh, uh, Jesus instructing the 12 disciples. These are his parables. These are his sayings. Uh, this is what happened when he finished everything. And what's going on there is that Matthew is presenting Jesus as the new super Moses. Um, Moses had promised that God one day would send a prophet uh, like me. Uh, Moses says a prophet like me uh, from among the people, and he's going to set everything right. And Matthew is saying Jesus is that one. Jesus is the promised one. And so in many ways, Matthew is uh, presenting what Jesus did as kind of this new super Moses. And once you are clued into that, uh, here's how it might work. Uh, Moses was uh, a wicked king tried to kill him. Uh, Moses was the redeemer, and as a child, there was a wicked king, the Pharaoh, who dictated that the mothers all throw their uh, babies in uh, the Nile River among the reeds, and eventually God had that wicked king throw himself in the Reed Sea, or Red Sea, it's called both uh, in Scripture. And so Moses, a wicked king, tries to kill Moses, and Moses later expounds the law on top of a mountain. And he has the leaders of uh, uh, Israel uh, come up to him on the mountain. He presents his work in five sections um, called the Pentateuch. Uh, in uh, academic li literature, the five scrolls. And um, he, his culminating event is a Passover which frees the people, and then the intent was that those free people would then become missionaries who uh, bring the kingdom of God to the nations. Well, you step back and ask yourself, is, does anything like that happen to Jesus? And you realize that Matthew is the only one who tells us that Herod tried to kill God's Redeemer. And uh, he didn't have the women throw their children. He just sent out his soldiers and killed uh, every child under two years old for a uh, 10-mile uh, radius in any direction. Uh, but he was a wicked king, and God held him to account. But he was trying to kill God's Redeemer. And then we come to Romans 5 through 7, and we hear that Jesus comes to a mountain and his disciples, and remember these 
the names of these disciples are some of the uh, names of the 12 tribes. And what does he do? He expounds the law on the top of a mountain. But the difference is Moses gets really mad and breaks the law because uh, Israel can't fulfill it. And what Jesus does is he takes away our stony heart and gives us a real heart in the new covenant and then writes the law on our hearts. So Jesus is a better Moses because he can actually transform us into law keepers. And of course, there are five sections in uh, Matthew's gospel. And so it may be that those five sections, it, it may be that they're actually related somehow to uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And of course, Jesus died on the cross on Passover. And what's the result? Uh, the result is uh, I send you out to the nations and I want you to make disciples of all people. And so there's a parallel. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, there's a parallel between what Moses did and what Jesus is doing. The difference is that Jesus is not simply a man, a flawed man like Moses, but Jesus rather is the perfect man. In fact, he's God incarnate. He came to set right all that the first Adam set wrong. And so you start thinking about that and you start realizing that Matthew is presenting Jesus as the new super Moses. And I think if you read it that way, you realize maybe what Matthew is doing and how incredibly helpful those promises are. So let's look at some of the details in uh, Matthew. And um, this is how Matthew starts. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And then it goes into what seems to be an interminable uh, genealogy. And uh, if we're just being honest, uh, how many of you, when you come to something like this, just kind of think, oh, no long list of names. Can I get to, and we come because we think this is absolutely unimportant. And not only is it unimportant, it's uh, unhelpful to um, live our lives as believers because this is just kind of junk in terms of what's on the page. And I think everyone who's ever come to this um, that that's the initial reaction. But I would like to make the case that um, this, in fact, may be one of the most beautiful things you've ever uh, seen, and I want to kind of help, help us with that. So this phrase, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So... Uh, Matthew starts his uh, book. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, when, when you read that, uh, do you like biblical theological bells go off and you think, oh my goodness, there it is? And the answer is no. Nobody has that happen. But I want to show you something from the text. And this is the text. This is the text in Matthew. The book of the Genesios of Jesus Christ. And um, Matthias, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, do you know what that second word, another translation for that second word uh, would be? This would be the lexical form uh it might help. That's that's the form that it would appear in the lexicon. What what is that word like? It's the word Genesis. This is the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. And I know from the Old Testament that this is at Genesis two four 
the book of the Genesis of heaven and earth. So in other words, Matthew is saying, what I'm about to tell you is related to something in the Old Testament. Now in English, it's almost impossible to see that because they help us with the word Genesis to translate it as generation. And that's a fair translation. But in translating it that way, it makes us impossible to connect the text to Genesis 2-4. But you see in the original language, the connection is there. In fact, this in the Old Testament is part of one of the weirdest things in the text that happens over and over and over again. It's part of what scholars call this phrase, these are the Toledoth of. Toledoth is simply uh, the Hebrew word uh, translating this. Well, what are these Toledoth? What are these 13 Toledoth in the Old Testament? Well, here they are. Um, so uh, 13 times in the Old Testament, you have the phrase, these are the Toledoth of blank. And you can see that 2-4 is the first one. Of heaven and earth, of Adam, of Noah, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, of Shem, of Terah, of Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, who is Edom, and uh, remember that Edom is spelled like that in the text, and Adam is spelled like that in the text. In other words, Edom and Adam are the same exact word. And remember that this guy sells his birthright for um, food, and he gets rejected because, oh my goodness, this is a little Adam story. So, Toledoth, Esau, Edom, Jacob, Aaron, Perez. So, 13 times in the Old Testament, uh, 10 of which, uh, well, depend, depending on how you count it, the majority are in Genesis, and then you have two more. And that's where the Old Testament ends in terms of the Toledoth. And you look at that and you say, okay, I just don't get what's going on there. Well, let me see if I can help with it. Toledoth is related in Hebrew to the word yelid. And if you ever have the great privilege in life to take Hebrew, Every single person who's ever tried to remember the word yelled has the same mnemonic device. A woman yells when she has a baby, and so yelled means to have a baby. That's the, the word in Hebrew. And toledoth is simply a noun form of that having a baby. So the way these work is you have the person introduced and then the Toledoth tells you what happens as a result. It's the baby that was born. And so when you have Genesis 1, God creates everything, then he says this is the Toledoth of that. And he tells the Adam and Eve story. That's probably explaining why there are two... Uh, seemingly different stories uh, of the creation that's related to this Toledoth. Uh, it's somehow saying this thing in one is foreshadowing something else. And let me tell you about Adam and Eve's story. And then ultimately, let me tell you about uh, Jesus and the church. When you look at the Toledoth, however, there are two names that are missing that you would have expected one is Abraham. Abraham is like the main character uh, pre-Moses, but his name is missing. Uh, his father is there. This is the Toledoth of Terah, but Abraham doesn't have his own Toledoth, and neither does David. 
David's great-grandfather has a Toledoth, but David doesn't have a Toledoth. And so that's really weird. You know, you look at that and you say, okay, you have the character introduced, and then this is what that produced. And so uh, with the Noah story, it says Noah found grace in God's eyes. And what did that grace produce? It produced uh, Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. This is the baby that uh, was birthed out of what I've just told you about. And so in the Old Testament, you have 13 of these Toledos, but they're missing Abraham and they're missing David. And when Matthew starts off his book, he says, this is the Toledoth of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you think, oh my goodness, Matthew is saying that, that the Jesus event is explaining all those crazy details in the Old Testament. That somehow the Jesus event is making all that make sense. And so we have this genealogy. And as it goes, and as we read through, if you take time to, uh, like, put this on a piece of paper, what you realize is there are 14 generations from, and Matthew even tells us, 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to Babylon, and 14 generations from Babylon to Christ. And all of a sudden you realize, I've been looking for that 14th Toledoth forever. And Matthew is saying, here it is. Here it is in the person of Jesus. And not only is, is it there, but it's bringing together everything that the Old Testament had promised. And so Matthew says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. One of the accounts tells us it's angel Gabriel, and Gabriel is the one who made the prediction in Daniel that uh, all these years later, uh, this event would happen, and that event is tied up with uh, Jesus. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, she will bear a son. And you, you adoptingly, uh, you adopting him as your son, as your heir, as uh, your legitimate heir, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And you look at that and you start realizing how much of the biblical text that's bringing together. Um, uh, it's bringing together, I wish I'd taken that animation out, sorry about that. But you will call his name Iesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And remember in the Old Testament, Jesus is the word Joshua. Uh, Joshua is the one who comes after Moses. Joshua is the one who takes the people from Abel Shatim, the field of thorns, into the land flowing with milk and honey. And Matthew is saying that's who Jesus is. Jesus is this new uh, super Moses, the one coming after Moses, the one who will set his people free. And recall that Jesus said in John 8, uh, Truly I say to you that everyone who commits a sin is a slave of sin. Jesus came to set slaves free. 
Jesus uh, came to break the power of canceled sin. And Matthew is saying that's what he did. Uh, Luke has the same thing. Suddenly two men, uh, El Moses and Elijah, Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus. Whose exodus? Jesus' exodus, which we he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah had one thing in common. In the well, two things, I guess. They both fasted forty days, and they both saw Yahweh on top of Mount Sinai. And now these two men are seeing Jesus transformed on top of a, a mountain, and they're talking with him about his ex hados. When we come to Matthew, we see Matthew has this statement, the virgin. Some translations say a virgin, but that's not what's written in the text. It says the virgin uh, will conceive and will ha have a son, bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Well, that's quoting. Well, I guess this is the text uh, from Isaiah. That's quoting um, being quoted in Matthew. The virgin, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. And you will call his name Emmanuel. And then uh, Matthew says, in case you don't know what that means, which is be, being interpreted, God is with us. And that's who Matthew is presenting um, Jesus as being God uh, with us, God incarnate. Now, things to notice in Matthew 1, notice the symmetry and order of God's plan. There's so many things that we come to the text and we just skip over. I, I used to call those things skippers, you know, and uh, things like uh, when uh, Moses outlines the calendar of the events in Noah's flood, you know, it's nothing but dates. Skip over that. Genealogy, skip over that. And then I realized that none of those things are unimportant. All of them are picked up in one place or another in the Bible. And there's a symmetry, and we begin to see it in Matthew 1. The Old Testament predicts the coming of a virgin-born Messiah. And uh, I hope we have time to go through those uh, slides uh, to see that it is virgin and not young woman. The Old Testament is full of real-life failures of the Old Testament characters, and those are being contrasted with the perfection of Jesus. And there's a connection, Matthew is helping us see there's a connection, that the Old Testament is the backstory of the New Testament. It's the one that makes nearly everything make sense. 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. Now, how many of you thought it was a little weird the other day when we started talking about gematria? Be truthful, you know, where words are numbers and like, okay, that's kind of weird to me. Okay, it's weird to everybody the first time they look at it. Because, you know, you say, well, Okay, that could really be abused, and that's true. Some uh, false prophets try to somehow use gematria to convince you to send them money so they can buy a new Learjet. Well, people who do that are self-evidently frauds, so just throw them out. Uh, but that doesn't mean that gematria isn't in the Bible just because some people use it fraudulently. In fact, when I learned Hebrew in the days before computer all those years ago, I had a book where all the numbers of the concordance were written in gematria. And I can't tell you how many times I've stood with that book and gone, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yud, uh, uh, 
cop lamed mint. Okay, uh, forty, right? So, like, I've got a book that actually uses gematria to convey the numbers. And if if you ever go into a Jewish cemetery and you look at the dates, all those dates are going to be written not with uh, Arabic numerals. They're going to be written in gematria because Jews use gematria. And ancient Jews use gematria. Well, if every word has an inherent number, like, I wonder what numeric value the name David would have. Well, why don't we find out? Uh, so that's a D. And that's a V, and that's a D, right? There are no vowels. In other words, if we went to our uh, Logos Bible software and pasted the word David in, this is what we would get. 14. In other words, from Abraham to David, there's a David. From David to Babylon, there's a David. And from Babylon to Jesus, there's a David. In other words, God is so in control of history that when you step back and you start reading things, you start reading things like on the very day. On that very day. The 25th at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day, in the 14th day, on that very day. And what those texts are telling us is this, is that when we stand before God into heaven and look at the entire scope of human history, what we're going to see is that God has events ordered. And there's a reason. And there's a perfection and there's a rightness and things are happening exactly the way that God set it out to happen. I don't know if you have ever thought about this, but God knows the second that you were born. And God knows the second that you will die. The Bible says that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Your life is going to be like this to the very day. All of human history will be like that. Very so God is orchestrating things so that there is a meta-narratival, plot-symmetrical elegance to everything that happens. And what God has done is he's hidden it in plain sight. It's the glory of God to hide things, the glory of kings to search them out. Uh, God wants you and me to be kings and to search out the glories of his revelation. We see that in things like this, and things like this happen everywhere in the Bible. It's all pointing to Jesus. It's all oriented to Jesus. And so when we have the ge genealogy and we set it out, we see that there's, there's elegance there, there's unity. Now, if I were giving this lecture on a state university, someone in the back would stand up and say, wait just a minute. You pulled a fast one. Because there aren't 14, you only get 14 if you count this guy twice. And 
not only that, but you've left six people out to get your 14. Cheater, cheater, cheater. Uh, pumpkin, you know, like you're saying plot symmetrical uh, elegance and it's not there. Matthew made it up. He omitted six names. Well, I suppose I could say, I guess you're right. I guess the fact that there have been 2,000 years of scholarship on the Bible, people still uh, saying, I guess you're right. I guess I should give up. But I'm not about to give up. Because it's funny to me that Jehoram, who's Ahab's son, was under a curse that said for three generations, these people will be under a curse. And yes, this guy was king, but God didn't make him king. The mob made him king. And this guy was king. God didn't make him king. Pharaoh made him king. And this guy was king, but God didn't make him king. Nebuchadnezzar made him king. And oh, by the way, wasn't this guy reinstated according to the Old Testament? Yes, he was reinstated, so it's perfectly valid to count him twice or, or else count the Babylon, Babylonian captivity. The Bible absolutely can stand up to rigor, but don't, don't ever give in to somebody who needs the Bible to be untrue. He's going to briefly look at it and uh, kind of throw up the objections. There are a lot of things like that, but they can't stand the rigor. Some people don't even know that the Old Testament has these three kings under a curse. No, what Matthew is saying, there were 14 legitimate rulers between um, uh, David and Babylon. There were 14 generations after And here's the proof of the curse. Uh, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. In other words, who did this guy marry? He married Ahab's daughter. Oh, I didn't look up that. Well, we should have it all. Uh, it all makes sense. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So what does Deuteronomy say? You should not bow down to them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And then here's the curse, the actual curse. You will strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge Je on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, in the blood of all the servants of the Lord, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free, and I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Bashan, the son of Ahijah. Those three are not legitimate rulers because they're under the curse on Ahab, and that's why Matthew, and remember Matthew's vocation in life, he was a tax gatherer. In other words, he kept careful list and he added things up. I don't know, who are you going to put your money on? Uh, somebody who can read Hebrew like Matthew could, who carefully studied and who kept list and added things up, or are you going to believe someone who's trying to prove that the Bible shouldn't be followed. I think I'm going to follow Matthew. Well, some people would say, well, what about Matthew's genealogy, Luke's genealogy? They're different. And I think I have the slide here. Well, maybe I, maybe I don't have it here. Uh, but if you put the two genealogies, they agree to David. Basically, they agree to David. But after David, they don't agree. After David, uh, Matthew goes with Solomon, 
and Luke's goes with Nathan. Well, what does the text say? You will adopt him and he will be your son. If this is talking about the legitimate rulers of Israel, if Joseph adopts Jesus, then that makes Jesus the legitimate ruler. He's from the house of David, but he's also from the physical lineage of David. And that's what Luke is telling us. There's a reason why the genealogies uh, differ. Well, what about this thing the virgin will conceive? Uh, this harkens back to the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.5. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And recall that Isaiah isn't saying a virgin will conceive. Isaiah says the virgin will conceive conceive. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, that is the seed of the serpent, and her seed, that is the seed of the woman. He will crush you on the head, and you will crush him on the heel. And remember that the heel is also the word Jacob in uh, Hebrew. Uh, so there's something going on there. And the something going on is Isaiah 7.14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign uh, and in our translation, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Okay, is Isaiah, it's clear that Matthew is talking about a virgin, but is Isaiah talking about a virgin? Can the text stand up to rigorous scrutiny? Well, let's see. In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Reza, the king of Samaria, Pekah, the king, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go up to meet Ahaz, you and Sha'er Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washman's field. Does that seem weird to you? Isaiah is going to prophesy, and God says, make sure you take your little boy with you. How many other times in the Old Testament does God tell a prophet, take their little boy with them? Zero. Go to the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washerman's field. That seems like a pretty specific place to me. I wonder why that is being told. Now remember what Isaiah 6 is about. That's where Isaiah sees the Lord and uh, the Lord says, Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Hear my sin to me. And that's usually where all sermons end in Isaiah 6. But Isaiah 6 actually continues and says, okay, go and preach in a way so that they won't get it. Make their heart hard. Lest seeing they see with their eyes and hearing they hear with their ears and turn and I heal them. Isaiah, preach in a way so that they can't get it. The very next sentence says, Isaiah goes to confront Ahaz, and maybe he's holding his little baby boy. 
right? Take your son with you. And Isaiah gives this um, uh, prophecy to Ahaz. And then the very next chapter says he went home and he slept with his wife. That's kind of a weird thing to talk about in a prophecy, isn't it? But that's what uh, chapter 8, he goes home, he sleeps with his wife. They have a child and name the child Mahar Sha'al Hashbaz. Swift is the uh, booty, speedy is the prey. And so you read that and you say, oh, that's the virgin will conceive. Well, help me with something. If you're holding a little baby in your arms, right? Is there a conclusion that you can uh, kind of go to about whether or not Isaiah's wife is a virgin or not? I mean, I suppose she could be a virgin, but kind of the baby being there is kind of weird. Well, maybe it's a young woman. Well, you tell me. This is what God says, and I think I have too much. Uh, why would Isaiah tell him to take his son? Why would he tell him to stand at the conduit? And how does it relate to chapter 6? It says, preach in a way where they won't get it. I apologize for the Hebrew. <laughs> you don't have to even read the language to know that these two are the same. These are all the same words. This is the word in. That's all the same words. This is quoted in Ezekiel 36. This is what happens with Hezekiah when he's about to... Um, just freak out because Jerusalem's about to be destroyed. This is the place where the king curses them from. This is years and years and years and years later. God is saying, go tell the house of David, not Ahaz, tell the house of David, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Then God says this. He said, listen now, O house of David. Is it a too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of God? God had just told Ahaz, ask for a sign. He says, make it as deep as Sheol. Make it as high as heaven. Make it as, as difficult as you can. And Ahaz, who was a wicked man, said, oh, I couldn't put the Lord to the test. Ahaz had tested the Lord every second of his life by his debauchery. And so what God says, therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. Let me ask you this. In your experience in life, is it unusual when people get married for them to have babies? Or is that kind of a normal thing? God's saying, I'm going to give you a sign, make it as high as heaven, and Ahaz won't do it. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a sign. A woman is going to have a baby. Stop the presses. Oh, my goodness. A woman's going to have a baby. That's never happened before except a trillion times. It's not a sign unless it's unusual. This is the word that's used. And people say, oh, it's not the word Betula. It's the word Alma. And I want to say, well, what does Alma mean? And I'm glad you asked. It means the secret one or the hidden one. This is where it's used elsewhere. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water. 
let the virgin who comes out to draw water, whom I was like, please give me a little water. This is, um, this is Abraham's servant finding a wife for Isaac. You tell me whether that girl was a virgin or not. Because I'm pretty sure if the servant brings home a girl who's not a virgin, that Abraham's going to punch him in the nose. This word is the hidden virgin, the, the one nobody's even seen yet. That's the word being used. If we had time, we would look at all of them. Um, but I see my time's gone. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.